In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO, SDSU Extension, for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. A series of four local events were held in South Dakota in Sioux Falls, Watertown, Belfouche, and Mitchell. There's been a lot of discussion about no-till and also about cover crops part of the Ministry of Soil Health. And so I thought I would talk about additional benefit related to wheat. And first of all, I'd like to, I'd like to explain some of the concepts related to wheat and no-till and cover crops. And then I'll talk about some systems where we use the combinations together. First of all, I'd like to talk about the impact of no-till on seeds. When the weeds produce their seeds and they fall to the soil, they can have a tremendous go to a series of phase. And this up here, several phase. Of course, we're familiar with the germination where we see a lot of seed and also the dormant seed, but also they can go through several other things. In other words, the insects can consume them, or the microbes can actually eat those weed seeds. Another phase is they can germinate and die. And also, they can simply die because they're not able to survive. We can develop a, a <coughs> when you leave the seeds on the soil surface with no till, this is quite damaging to the weed seeds. In other words, the weeds are. I need to stand back here. If you keep the weed seeds on the soil surface, that is actually the most damaging to the survival of the weed seeds. There was a study of, that could examine that issue. You can't hear me? Okay. There was, there was a study that examined the survival of green foxtail as affected by its position in the soil. What they did is they placed seeds into these fabrics and allowed them to have contact with the environment, also with the insects. They planted them at zero, two, and four inches down. And then they would harvest those samples, and then they determined how. Then, of course, this shows the, the depth in the soil. The seeds are zero, two, and four inches deep. This shows the percentage of live seeds. So we started out with 100%. So and this was after two years. So they were two years in the soil in these uh, packets. When they were planted four inches deep, 55% of the seeds are still alive after two years. But when you left them on the soil surface, when they were at the zero, only 11% were still alive. In other words, there was a five-fold difference. When you bury the weed seeds, it's five, five times more weed seeds survive over time. If you'll notice the two-inch, it's intermediate. It's almost a straight line. Almost every study that they've examined weeds on, they have found that weeds last longer when you bury them in the soil. The soil is like putting a coat on person. In other words, it just helps the seeds survive longer. So I'm sure these were buried continuously. What would happen if you were to till annually or whatever? I always noticed that we had a lot more weeds when we till. So I did another experiment. And what I did is I, we had seed input, we just had it once. In other words, we established a site, we put the weeds, released all the seeds into the soil, and then we went out and established two treatments. One is we continuously no-till, and the other is we tilled one time. And we simply tilled superficially, so to speak, it was one to five inches. In other words, it was not a moldboard pile. And what we did then is we counted the number of seedlings weekly for three years. We had to have four sites. What I have here is the number of seedlings from zero to 100%. I used percentage because I had 16 different replications of sites. 
This shows the seedling numbers for year from year number one, number two, and number three. This yellow bar refers to my tail treatment, and the white bar refers to my no tail. To let you know exactly what I was doing, what I did is I identified an area kind of like this table. I would mark it. I would go out and measure, record the number of seedlings that emerged every week. I would then pull them, and I would keep that total, and then I would come back next year and repeat the same thing. So I got a sense of what was going on with the seeds in the soil. The first thing you'll notice, well, for example, when I had like a sample in the till, when I got 100 in the first year, I got 48 in the second year, and then 33 in the third, third year. That's in the same site. So the first thing I'd like you to notice, if you look at the depth and length of the bars, they decrease with time. And we're fortunate that weed seeds do die over time, and therefore the density declines. But I'd like you to compare the uh, no-till versus the till. So the yellow bar is a till, and this is a no-till. So in the first year, if we got 100 seedlings in our till system, we got 88 in no-till. In other words, there's really not much difference in the first year. In the second year, we got 48 seedlings in till, and we got 32 in the no-till. So they started to pick up a little bit of difference. But if you look at year number three, we had 33 seedlings in the till. We had only four. In other words, we have an eight-fold difference here. A ratio of one to eight. This is a ratio of one to 1.5, so it's a ratio of one to one. In other words, the benefit of no-till takes some time. It doesn't occur in the first year. It takes a few years. I'm sure you wonder what value is that because if you, you're you growing crops every year, but I wanted to give you an example. If you look on the top, I list a couple of rotations here. Soybean corn and then soybean, soybean, oat corn. What that does is if you're in a, soybeans, you would be over here. So if you look at my diagram of soybeans, you see wheat seeds that are produced in soybeans drop down to the soil. So in year number one, if you were in a tilled system, if you had one, you would have 100 seedlings that would arrive. Well, if you happen to be in a system where you have soybeans, winter wheat, oats, and corn, what you do is you move the corn over to year number three. If you happen to be in a no-till system, you would have only four seedlings. In other words, by the time you plant corn, if you're in a two-year rotation with tillage, you will have 100 seedlings in your corn. In contrast to the cycle of four, you'd have only four. You'd have only four seedlings. In other words, the system gave you 96% weed control even before you do the herbicide. The reason that happened is, in winter wheat and oats have such a different growth period that when you harvest your the crops, you prevent, you get a more probability of preventing those wheat seeds that are common in corn and soybeans from producing wheat seeds. And so therefore, the system provides you a benefit for weed control. And because you have a diversity, you tap into the no-till benefit. If you happen to be a no-till and you stick with continuous corn or corn and soybeans, you really don't have much impact, much benefit. But if you can get that uh, diversity, that helps you. Now, if you were to use extremely high rates of herbicides and ensure that all the plants in your corn and soybeans die, you would gain this benefit too. The drawback with that is that you If you do intensive herbicide control to try to gain this benefit, of course, what you do is you accelerate the appearance of resistant weeds. So the key point there, no-till no can be a benefit from you if you could figure out ways to increase the diversity across different life cycles. Also, the cover crops itself is, can be quite a benefit. On the title of my slide, I'm talking about Plant mulch, but I'm not trying to add another term. You're on. Okay, it's just that crop residues or after harvest residues are also effective. 
Yeah, so I'm just putting them together. Cover crops and plant mulch that's in crop residues the same, so there's even a general term of, of plant mulch. This could be a benefit for <coughs> weed control. And this is actually related to the quantity of material that you have on the soil surface. So if you, you're thinking about suppressing weeds after winter wheat harvest or, or after corn harvest, or using a cover crop and then uh, spraying it out, the impact on a weed would be related to mulch quantity. This is a study that was done in, the example I'm going to give you is a study done in Nebraska by a friend named Gail Wicks. What he did is he established quantities of winter wheat residue on the soil surface. And then for the following year, he monitored the number of weeds that emerged compared back to their control. If you look here, I have percentages. This would be the amount of reduction. This is the residue level, 1,500 up to 6,000. You'll note that when they have this bar here represents this value of 16, means that if you had 100 seedlings in your control, you'd get 84 in this treatment, you have 16% reduction in the number of weeds. If you look over at the 6,000, you get 70%. The key point is the more quantity you have, the greater suppression and reduction in the number of weeds. It's almost a direct line. It's pretty close to about 10% per 1,000 pounds of, of plant material. The reason why this happens is when you put the residue on the soil surface, one thing it does is it reduces the amount of light that reaches down to the soil surface. Some weed species are sensitive to light. When you get a certain quantity of light or maybe quality of light, it stimulates them to germinate. Another aspect is that when you put the residue on a soil surface, it alters the temperature range. A lot of species are actually respond to the highs and lows. So when you put the residue on it, you actually moderate that, and therefore it's outside of the optimum temperature range for the weed to germinate. You've probably heard a lot about allelopathy. A lot of times these compounds, the after-harvest residues, will release a compound that will suppress germination of a weed. And physical impedance, what that means is sometimes it's hard for the seedling to grow through all the residue and survive. Also, another factor that affects this is that species vary in their response to the plant mulches. This is a study where they put on 3,000 pounds in the springtime, and they monitored the response of these various species. The green hogstail, redwood pigweed, common lamb's quarter, barnyard grass, and velvet pig. These are just the abbreviations I'll use in the next slide. What I show here is the percent reduction. So this would be the green hogshell, redwood pigweed, common lamb's quarter, barnyard grass, and velvet pig. To compare our like green hogshell, we have a value of 78. In other words, in our control, if we got 100 seedlings, we'd only get 22 of green hogshell. So there's a tremendous suppression of this species. If you look at velvet pig, we only had a 26 value. In other words, it varies some of the species. Probably has a very large seed and able to grow through a lot of material a line on the soil surface. So the key point is the amount of residue impacts how much weed control you get, but also the species vary in their response to the residue. I thought I'd show you a little bit about field trials, how much benefit mulches can be. What we did here is we examined the impact of red clover. What we did is we we're in a sequence of winter wheat going into corn. That's what we're, and so what we did is we plant under seeds <coughs> clover into winter wheat and also into spring wheat. So our winter wheat was planted in the fall as soon as it warmed up in the spring and early April. We planted the clover. We also planted spring wheat and clover together on the same day. This is what it looks like here. This is the under seed clover after harvesting. If you look over there. It's a, control with a lot of weeds, a lot of fox hills and common lens cord. When we examined the weed control after about six weeks, we reduced weed biomass 98 percent. In other words, the underseed the clover was completely eliminated the need for herbicide after a week. We did examine, we had weed free versus uh, clover underseeded. We the winter wheat was not affected by it. At the time that we harvested winter wheat, that clover was maybe three or four inches tall. When we did with spring wheat, we lost 17% of our yield. That's kind of logical because of the 
100 seeded clover started growing at the same time as spring wheat. And in contrast with the winter wheat, which had several tillers at the time we planted. Also, we, in this same study, we did a, a further follow-up. We had downy growth that was common in some parts of our plots, and so we monitored the impact of this mulch on the downy brome growth. So what we did is we had a series of treatments along with the underseed clover. We had an oat peat mix. This was planted after we harvested either of the winter wheat or spring wheat. So it was planted in early August. And we had our control. And the downy brome at this time all emerged about the same time that we planted the oat peat, which had been in uh, early August. What I have here is the number of seeds per quadrant. And so what I did is I went out and identified the quadrants about the 1st of September. We had a, somewhere around 35 plants per quadrant. I monitored them over time, and then in the spring, I counted the number of seeds per quadrant. <coughs> when we had our control, those, we had about 35 plants, and they produced somewhere over 7,000 seeds. <coughs> we took those same plants in the underseed clover, we had only 75 seeds. Because we were monitoring these over time, we were able to recognize that the 35 plants in the control, there's about 32 of them still alive in the springtime. In the uh, clover, 35 plants emerged, but the great majority of them died in the clover. In other words, the clover outcompeted them. And so when we got to the spring, we barely had any down the ground. Those 75 seeds came from plants that emerged in the spring. If you look at the value for the oat peas, we have about 4,000, or we suppressed downy brown seed production about 40%. The reason I include that, that shows that <coughs> how much variation you can have with the type of co uh, cover crop that you use. If you get a head jump on the weeds, they're much more effective than if the weeds start emerging and growing at the same time. Another benefit of this is this produced 50 to 80 pounds of biological nitrogen, so for your following crop, it would work very well. And so, one is a little bit with you about integrating this into weed management. We recognize that no-till can be a benefit for uh, helping weed seeds to die over time, and then the plant mulch was gained by suppressing the virgins. We actually integrated this with some other factors. We did not believe that no tilling and cover crops could control weeds on their own. I used to be out in Colorado, and one of the reasons why I talk about this diversity is producers out there, if they were to grow rotation, say, two cool season crops followed by two warm season crops, they reduce the herbicide use tremendously. In fact, they could grow three crops out of four without using any herbicides. They were doing things like dry peas where we follow my corn and crust and milk. And so for them, weeds were not even an issue. They said it was one of the smaller branches of the production tree. So when I got moved to South Dakota, I thought I'd explore the impact of winter wheat oats into soybeans, see what kind of impact it had on the weeds in soybeans. I also included a rye cover crop. And so one treatment I had was complete no-till and, and I added the mulch. I got the after harvest crop residue from both small grains and I had it dry. Then I had a tilt control. That tilt between each of the crops to control the weeds. And I monitored the weed emergence in soybeans. And so what I did is I sprayed out the soybeans in the control and also in the where I had the no-till at the time of planting and I did not use any more herbicides at all. I just monitored what happened inside the crop. What I have here is the number of wheat plants per square meter. We have wheat, this is average over four years. We're pretty close to May 15th for our planting day. This is showing the calendar day. On May 22nd, the first week, you'll note that we did not have anything in no town. We had somewhere around 12, 13 weeks in reverse in the till. In the second week, which would be about May 29th, we had two or three plants in no till. We would have over 40 in our till. In other words, we have more than 50 plants, 50 weeds infesting the till, but we only had two in the no-till. And if you continue on, you'll notice that the no-till line is quite a bit low. In fact, there was, you put them all together, 
wheat density was five times higher in, in till. And not only that, it emerged two to three weeks earlier. And when we looked at that, uh, we measured the wheat biomass. This was done seven weeks after uh, soybean emerged. I have the no-till and the till. You notice in our no-till, we have 10 grams of dry matter per square meter. We have 110 for our wheat control suppression, 91%. We then wanted, we also split our plots in half where we had one half completely weed free and the other half we just let them re grow for the whole season. We only had 2% yield loss in our no-till with no herbicides for the entire year. We used it at plenty of time and then on we only had 2% yield loss. In our till system we had 43%. In other words, there was a 20-fold difference in the impact of weeds simply because we had more weeds with tillage and they occurred quite a bit earlier. I'm continuing this exploring and trying to help the organic farmers get to a no-till system. So what I did was a very similar treatment. I maintained a no-till for winter wheat, oats, and then soybeans. I talked about the underseed and clover. I added that into this. I'm trying to control weeds here. I'm using well seed radish plus oats. Winter kills on its own, so we that using the herbicides. And we also compared that to the tilt system. And we found here uh, in our no till plus the mulch, we had 49 grams of dry matter, we had 135 in our till. Well, that's kind of unusual in a way, as we actually tilled at plenty of time here to get that 130. And this is what came after the till plenty of time. The 49, I'm sure, included some that emerged over winter in the spring. Where we didn't have a chance to control any of that. If you look at our yield loss, we reduced the yield loss due to weeds by one half. Now, if you happen to be in a system where you did have herbicides, it would be very easy to eliminate. But the point is, the use of no-till into the system and also the use of cover crops is helping us to suppress the impact of weeds. I'll give you a figure, photos. This is the tillage, <coughs> no mulch, this first is a no-till and we included the mulch in the This is in the first year of the organic study. This shows what it's like in the second year. We are having some problems with weeds in here. Compared back to our mulch, I don't know how my feet look quite a bit better than the organic no-till. <coughs> I'd like to deviate just a little bit. I got involved in studying the interaction between plants, and we noticed that there are some plants that seem to have an unusual impact on the following plants. In other words, it's more water use, more resource use efficient. The example I'm working here with is dry peas. There was quite a bit of work on this in the country of Australia. What they found is that winter wheat following dry peas was more efficient in using water than following several other crops. And the second thing that we know is that this impact is much greater in no-till. In other words, when winter wheat follow dry peas compared to following oats or canola or barley or even follow, in the tilled system it would produce five to eight percent more yield with the same water supply. When it was in no-till, it would produce 25 percent more. In other words, the synergism was three times greater in a no-till system. And so I got interested in this, and I explored this with the impact of dry peas on corn. What I did here was over a two-year study. In the first year, I grew corn, soybeans, spring wheat, and dry peas. Then in the second year, I planted corn across all of the same plots. And in the corn year only, I split the plots into wheat-free and wheat-infested. I used foxtail millet as an indicator species because I wanted to have a uniform infestation level of weeds. At the sites that I picked, we were in no-till, and we had at least seven years of no-till, so we were trying to tap into the no-till effect that seems to enhance the synergy. <coughs> this shows the weed-free I'm expressing here in yields of bushels per acre. If you look at this white bar, this is when these yield, these bars represent corn yields. So this is a corn yield following dry peas, this is following spring wheat, following soybeans, and following corn. 
Uh, you'll notice that the corn yield is only 69 bushels per acre. At our location in eastern South Dakota, our soil can be awfully wet, awfully cool in the spring. And corn is actually toxic to itself. And this toxicity is actually greater when you have cold soils and high water temperature, high water level. And so this, this system is set up for a lot of toxicity corn, so we've got 69 bushels per acre. Now, if you look at the yields in these other three alternative crops, they're above 100 bushels. Just bringing in any crop other than corn eliminated that toxicity because you didn't have a corn residue there. But you'll notice when in all of spring wheat and soybeans, we average 105 bushels. When corn followed dry food, we got 121, 15 bushel shelf in yield. I'm not really sure why that is. But we also noticed that another trend, when we brought the weeds in, here this shows the weed infested at a uniform milling level of, of competition. You'll notice here, corn after corn, we got about 13 bushels. Again, the toxicity of corn was to itself. It was not toxic to the fox and millet. So we allowed the fox and millet to really hammer the corn. What did get after soybeans and, and spring wheat? We more than doubled the yield of corn. But look what happened when we had dry peas as a recent crop. We got twice as much yield with the same wheat investigation as if we did in the crop and soybeans. In other words, dry peas bring something special to the table. We're not really sure what it is. I believe it's related to the microbial changes, which Mike has talked about earlier. In Canada, they've studied this quite a bit, and they feel that dry peas has a very favorable impact on what they call a class of bacteria called rhizobacteria. And it's also very favorable in mycobiota. And that these two actually synergize. They enhance the growth of the crop somewhere between 25 and 30% when you put them together. But again, we're not really sure exactly why, but something very special is going on. Well, the reason I'm mentioning this is this dry pea effect occurs even if you grow it only six or eight weeks. In other words, if you grew it as a cover crop, you would still get this benefit. And so it, if you can improve your resource use efficiency somewhere between 15 and 20 percent, that means you can have it. When we examined our stuff with corn, it was not related to nitrogen. In fact, this impact was created during years when we put on too much nitrogen during the stress years. You notice that when we had weed imposing a stress, the impact of dry peas was even greater. In Australia, they've also found that lupins has a very favorable impact on the following crop, increasing resource use efficiency. The dif difference with this, though, it is related to how much biomass of lupins that you have. In other words, if you only have a small amount, you're going to get a very limited impact. Also, I put on lentils here. When I worked on this synergism, I was trying to identify, I was working with cash crops. I was trying to identify all the crops that possibly would show this. And there were some research that showed lentils had a small effect on half of what it does after dry peas. <coughs> the only other crop that I've seen this happen is corn is synergistic to other crops that follow it, such as soybeans and also protein. Kind of a summary, of, I know in the field of wheat science, we've been trying to help producers reduce the amount of herbicides that they need. And there's been some assessments of, of producers who have been following integrated system projects. And what they did is this was based on producer uh, actual data, not on experimental stuff of what farmers were actually applying. And in these studies, one was in the Netherlands, they showed that by following these integrated systems, <coughs> they reduced the use of pesticides or herbicides 28%. In the country of England, they reduced it 32%. And then also in the U.S. Great Plains, it reduced it 50%. There were two main factors that were involved with this reduction in pesticide herbicide use. One was that you used complex rotations, rotations that had a diversity of life cycles, <coughs> such as corn and winter wheat. This doesn't really work if you stick with the rotation of corn, so it means or winter wheat and crowbars. You need to have a diversity of life. <coughs> the second thing is that they would have multi-tactic management. 
which also should be one of the factors. Another might be uh, any fertilizers. Now you notice that the values for the Netherlands and England are quite a bit lower than the Great Plains. There is a reason for that. In those two countries, the producers were using reduced time. In other words, they were tilling maybe once a cycle or maybe once every two years. For some reason, they continued to till. In the central Great Plains, this was continuous no-till for at least 10 years before they started to assess what the producers are doing. And they monitored this over a six-year interval. To give you an example of what they were doing, like in the central Great Plains, they identified eight producers who were doing what they call innovative group farming. And they would pair them up with a conventional producer that was very close to them. So we had eight pairs that generated this data. And the point was, as I mentioned earlier, the innovators in the Great Plains actually came to me and said, you don't have to worry about weeds anymore. They're simply not a problem for us in our integrated systems where they were doing like a four crop rotation of no till. They felt I was starting the synergism work and they felt that was much more meaningful for them in their future management. One last thing I'd like to mention is as you listen to the other speakers, they're talking about tying it in with nature a lot more. I think the weed management discipline, the weed science discipline is starting to recognize this too. And we're, we're trying to tap more into nature. When you think of that, use this term nature-based, no-till and cover crops help us get there. You know, we're developing systems that we're not quite so dependent on herbicides, especially like out in the Great Plains. Herbicides are actually our last resort rather than the first resort. They would only use herbicides if they had to. In fact, in a four crop rotation, they were able to put three crops without even using any herbicides and getting some of the highest yields in the region. So, uh, let me try to take any questions if you have some. Okay, the question was how did I intercede uh, interweed? Uh, red clover into interweed. We did it two ways. We planted and we also broadcast. And uh, I was kind of a skeptic about the broadcast. They both work very well. We just used the road to the They do a lot of broadcasting in, in Michigan, and that appears to work well. Uh, the only problem would be if you have any wind at all. That seems really small. It really has some gas. If it's windy, we need to fly. Yes. We, uh, we planned to winter week in September, and we came back in early April as soon as we warmed up. And we turned to our broadcast. And with the spring week, we did it the same day as planting the spring week. <coughs> The question was about the dry pea synergy in the corn. And did we get the same results if we did it harvested for a cash crop versus taking it as a cover crop? The work that I did, we always did it as a cash crop in Austin, Australia. We did have one year where our dry pea was sprayed out and our farm manager used the herb for soybean that he thought would work with lupins or work with dry pea that didn't. We only had 68 weeks growth in that year. And we, had, we could not tell the year difference. We did this over four years. Therefore, it did not matter if we grew eight weeks versus uh, the group from the season. In Australia, they monitored the amount of biomass produced by the dry pea in the year before. They found that it had no effect at all on its impact in the following cost. The reason being is they felt that if you get 16 weeks growth, you do have enough growth to impact on our food demand. And that's where we felt the change. I think you can use dry beans in the cover crop. So how do you kill out the clover in your wheat double then? What I was doing is, I was hoping just to have winter kill. And we had some problems, we weren't using mammoth red clover. We must have got a contaminated seed so we got medium. So that didn't work so good. So we're switching over to test crimson clover and also bursum clover. Now bursum is an annual, so that will not survive 
Chris from this is a biannual, but it does not have good winter hardiness. You can, you can survive the winter two or three hardiness zones south of us, but it will not survive in South Carolina. Time for one more question. <laughs> No, I haven't. I wouldn't think that would that wouldn't win I kill. Plus you're gonna have to spray it out until the reason I'm doing this is I'm trying to do it again, people would But it would work if you had herbicide.